It's um, definitely a good course. We have 24 people joining us. This is great. Good afternoon to everyone who's joining um, the uh, panel discussion this afternoon. So you'll be able to hear us. Um, we won't be able to hear you, but you will be able to join in and say hello on chat. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the screen, you've got your chat function. And hi, Ben Osborne. Um, we've got Caroline Russ. Uh, and love the hair, Rachel. That's the, yeah, we get mm -hmm. a vote from Caroline for that. <laughs> um, and uh, hi, Chris. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you, Chris, for your question. We, we, that, that has been noted and we might get to it later. Um, and uh, we have Alex as well, who I saw is coming back off furlough this week. He has. He has. He's, he's just here for more support or to give me some banter, I imagine. One or the other. One, 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 one or the other. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. Well, he can, he can only do it through chat or questions. So you can, well, exactly, you can't get yeah. Too he just called me, me after. <laughs> yeah. Alex, feel free to extend the support to the wider panel. <laughs> And good <laughs> afternoon to Gavin and uh, Niles. Good, th thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got 25. We think we had 47 joining. I'm hoping that um, uh, among those will be David Powell from Archant and then a whole load of names, which I've now closed my Excel, so I can't refer to them all. Um, oh, hello, David. Good afternoon. You are there. I can see you. So you've gone on to chat. Uh, thank you for your questions, David. We have uh, put those into the um, discussion document, so uh, they will come up. Um, we'll give it another couple of minutes, we're up to 27. I think we'll give it to Kayleen. If you give me the nod when you think we've probably got everyone, we should crack on. I'll start um, in a couple of minutes by asking each of our esteemed panelists to give a quick two minute introduction give you a moment here to think about it guys um you, your name obviously your company um uh, just whether you've stayed fully open uh, or gone fully into lockdown or some mix of uh, those two options um so uh, i'll do a quick intro and then we'll go kayleen what do you reckon we're up to 29 shall we go when we've got 30 no, no, you think? It's now four minutes past, and I think it's going to be a really good discussion. So rather than us overrunning, let's start and latecomers will just be latecomers. Latecomers will be latecomers. Okay, that sounds good. Right, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, who've joined us on this uh, lovely Tuesday afternoon from wherever you are in Norfolk or across the eastern region, if you've come from further afield. Um, we have on our panel today four good local leaders, all very experienced business people to share their uh, views and experiences of uh, leadership in lockdown and how to re manage teams remotely. Um, we have Rachel Cowdery from Break uh, Charity. Uh, Rachel is sporting a particularly fine pink uh, hairdo, um, which she, she is doing for, ch for charity, to raise funds for charity. So um, please have a look at the Norfolk uh, Chamber's latest bulletin where there's a link talking about that. We will be sharing that also on uh, social media and perhaps, uh, Kayleen, if you've got time, you could share the link in, in the chat function. Um, we have uh, John Gosling from Breakwater IT. You mustn't get break and breakwater confused in my head. Um, uh, we've got Lisa Colleen from uh, Flagship Housing Group, and which is, uh, Lisa was saying, was the largest uh, housing association in the east of England now with some, was it 35,000, I think you said, Lisa, 35,000 homes across That's the region, right. yeah. which is quite phenomenal. And then we have uh, James Gross from Indigo Swan. So good afternoon to everyone who's joined us. And I'm going to start with just a quick asking uh, of each of the panelists. If we start with um, Rachel, go Rachel, John, Lisa, James. Um, just a quick one to two minutes uh, update on who you are, who you represent and what state you're in, in terms of this lockdown, unlocking, where have you been? Okay, so Rachel, are you there? I am here, thank you very much. So I'm Rachel, the CEO at Break. Uh, we run, we are uh, leading a leading children's charity in East Anglia and we look after young people on the edge of care, in care and leaving care. So uh, as lockdown started, we closed all 48, 49 of our shops uh, and we uh, 
closed up our fundraising service uh, almost well just before the government closed down uh, and so we have been fairly severely hit by a loss of income of just over two million pounds hence my very small effort in the fundraising stakes with doing my hair I won't mention it again um, and uh, we focused very much in those early few weeks of ensuring that we were able to safely look after um, the young people that we provide homes for. So it's about 100 young people that we, we give a home to, some in our children's homes and some in our leaving care provision. And we made sure that we had contingency plans because at that point, I think there was a real image of COVID sweeping through uh, the country and therefore the county uh, and making sure that we always had staff to look after those young people. Um, so moving through on our journey, really, we then kind of looked up and looked out. Um, we started to plan for our recovery uh, and we are now three and a half weeks into our shops being open and uh, we are not anywhere near where we were pre-COVID, but I think we are doing better than most other places on the high street. So an amazing achievement. We furloughed uh, half of our staff, so about 25 people in all at the peak of furlough, where we couldn't do the work we would ordinarily. We kind of closed down and, and, and closed shop in those areas, quite literally. Uh, and we have not very many people left on furlough and we're almost as reopen as we will be for some time now. Trying to work out what we're going to do around fundraising uh, and um, making sure that we're as COVID secure in every part of our work but holding the young people and families that we work with very much at the heart of our planning. Thank you very much. That's an excellent summary. Uh, John, could we leap to you and find out about um, Breakwater IT and how you're standing? Yeah, I'm John Gosling, Managing Director of Breakwater IT. Um, we're a Microsoft Gold partner. We do everything Microsoft. Most of you have probably been using Teams. We've done a lot of work on that. We, as lockdown was imminent we started practicing working from home we then started working from home full-time just before boris made his announcement um we were really really busy at first because everyone's calling us trying to get us to work get them set up and working remotely then we had quite a flat patch and now we're starting to see things coming back a little bit we we had to furlough a few staff and we still got a few staff on furlough um but i'm hoping that we can start to sort that out in the next few weeks, we've been entirely dependent on our clients, especially being in Norfolk in the a lot of clients in the leisure industry having to shut down. Um, you know, the knock on implications of that and also people stopping doing projects, which is quite a big part of our work. Um, but we're now making plans to reopen the office. Um, we've done a bit of work, health and safety um, and making it look a bit better for when people do come back. Um, yeah, that's us. Great stuff. Lisa, could you update us on flagship? I will do. Thank you, Hugh. So Lisa Collin from Flagship Group. So we are a housing association and we're the largest in East Anglia and we are there to provide homes for people in need. So as Hugh mentioned, 35,000 homes now across the East. We also have a number of homes for sale for shared ownership, market rent and student accommodation. But predominantly our homes are there for the people most in need. And during, during this uh, recent pandemic, we were able to maintain an emergency plus and compliance service. So that's our housing services. We've also got a repairs and maintenance company, which is RFT and Gasway, our gas servicing company. So we provide the whole service, which enables people to both access their homes and then have sustainable tenancies during their time with us. Uh, we furloughed about 30% of our staff in the end, and that was to enable us to continue to provide a, an emergency and compliance service. Uh, most of those have started to return. We were about ready to have a, should we just test if more people can work from home? And suddenly we decided, you know what, why test? Let's just do it. We were already on that journey. We'd started agile working. We'd started thinking about the future workplace and how it would be to work in our environment and being less present. And so we just shut the offices and closed everything down, but were, had the technology and the connectivity to enable us to just go home and work from there where we could, but also keeping a crew out on the road so we could do emergency repairs, the gas and electrical compliance to keep our people safe. 
So this has effectively accelerated your work from home program by what, a couple of years or? or... <laughs> I'd say we were, we were 12, 12 to 18 months into at being agile. So enabling people to just do what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it and having that work life blend. But this was, this was a game changer for us. It did absolutely increase our ability to say, yeah, not only can we do it as individuals, but we have the leadership that says we trust you to do it as individuals. And, but starting that journey and recognize not everybody is at the same phase and some are ahead of us, uh, some are behind that curve. So this was a great opportunity of joining today to sort of share some of the things that we did and got wrong, as well as some of the things we've done and got right. And also to learn from my esteemed colleagues on the panel. Excellent. Well, I, I hope we will share, yes, exactly, that both what you've learned uh, and what, what, what might have been painful in the process of learning. James, could you update us on where you are with Indigo Swan? What's going on, Hugh? Uh, afternoon, everyone. James Groves, Managing Director of Indigo Swan. Uh, we were nowhere near ready to work <laughs> from home, but uh, thanks to John and his wonderful team at Breakwell IT, little plug, um, they, they sorted us out nice and quickly, uh, and Andy, our, our, ops, our ops manager in the office as well, was had his finger to the pole, should I say, with his spreadsheet predicting dates and things like that, and he managed to get that bang on. So, yeah, we weren't ready, but we got on with it and we, uh, we did it quickly, which was great. Uh, we, we did furlough uh, a, a number of the team um, in order, you know, to protect the company, but also to protect the people's jobs moving forward. I think that was the... The big aim for us was to make sure that, you know, there's a company left for when people come back and also jobs left for people when they come back as well. And that was just as important to us that we wanted to try and get through this with, without any redundancies if possible and so far so good, which is, which is great. Um, been able to continue to service our customers in, in, in the usual way that we do, um, which I'm proud to say. We, we've also started working with some new business as well, which is lovely for this time, you know, been able to help some people that we haven't worked with before. Um, and, you know, from the guys that have been working extremely hard, probably a little bit under capacity, uh, doing an amazing job working from home all the way through to the guys that have been furloughed and you know they're just general their care and their understanding and the challenges they've been through you know which I'll happily talk about today you know not working for four months which may be the only time in their working careers that that is likely to happen comes with its own set of challenges as it does the guys that have to be working under capacity extremely hard every day uh, from their homes which they're which they're not used to uh, culturally, we, we, you know, we've, we've had our challenges and we've done some different stuff. As, as most people in Norfolk know, we pride ourselves massively on the, on the culture of the company. Um, and I'm pleased to say that we've, if anything, hopefully strengthened that during this time um, by, you know, through the furloughed guys, but also the guys working as well. So, yeah, we're, we're in a good place at the moment, starting to get people back. Um, as you alluded to earlier, Hugh, Alex, who has joined us this afternoon as a guest, is, is back from furlough today. And we're starting to ease people back in, I think it's safe to say. We're not getting people back five days a week. Starting to ease people back in a couple of days at a time, you know, not working for, for four months is a long time. So let's, let's ease them back in a couple of days at a time and, and, and take a review of it every week and build it up from there and hopefully get everyone back and working full time over the course of the next couple of weeks and months ahead. Excellent. I think, I think that's it. We'll try and come back to that point about the difference between those who've been furloughed and those who had to continue working and what that might do in terms of culture and tensions and the, the different challenges each side. Um, face. Um, right, so uh, just in case anyone's wondering who uh, on earth I am, I'm Hugh Sayer, I'm a business writer, I'm also a non-exec director on the Chamber Board uh, and general loudmouth on social media if you wish to suffer such things. Um, and I've been working from home for 20 years so this seems, uh, when people say has it changed, well from <laughs> our little home office, no. But I do see what it's done for a lot of other people, uh, both both good and bad, and and uh, I've been very impressed with the way numerous contacts and um, friends have responded and their businesses have responded, so it's quite impressive. Um, last week I was listening to a podcast with um, a chap, who, I've got to pronounce his name carefully because his parents clearly were fans of the movie. He's Professor Sir Carrie Cooper, and he's president of management of the British Academy of Management and um, professor of organizational psychology and health at the Manchester Business School. And he was saying we need a new type of line manager, socially sensitive people with parity between technical and personal skills. Um, sort of struck me as an interesting uh, challenge. Um, 
which you might want to pick up on, but uh, the question I'm going to put to you guys is, how do you feel this crisis might have helped you develop as leaders or shaped your priorities as leaders? How do you think it might have changed your perspective of what it means to be a leader? So um, who would like to leap in first? James, you want to go? And then we'll go to Rachel and uh, go from there. Uh, you said this, you said that quote yesterday, you, when we were doing a little rehearsal. And I think I'll go back to my point I made then, where people who now think you need a leader who's got a good mix of technical and people ability uh, worries me slightly, because <laughs> I, t I, t I tend to believe that that's probably the types of leaders that we've always wanted and we, we've always looked for and, and aspired to be. Um, I think for me, what it's done is just reassure me on the way that I've always looked to do things and hopefully empowered the other leaders we have in the business to do things was, made, was hopefully the right way of doing it. And ultimately, it comes down to the people and it comes down to caring about them and their well-being. Um, you know, going into lockdown, it's the first time as a company in 10 years that we've been operating now that we've ever had to, you know, work from home for a prolonged period of time. It's the first time really any of us have worked from home at all, you know. We've, right. always been, we've always been in the office, you know, when you're in the office with 20 people, it's very easy to listen to what people are saying. You can chip in, you can have some quick conversations and stuff like that. You know, working from home for me at first was, was a nervous experience because I'm not a controlling person by any stretch of the imagination and hopefully my peers will say that. But at the same time, <laughs> I, I, I do like to be about it and I do like to know, to know what's going on and making sure we're going in the right direction and things like that. So it's, when we first started working from home, I would probably say it was a time of nervousness and how was it going to go and how were we going to perform and, you know, how were the guys going to cope? Um, but, you know, after a week of doing it and settling in, it just came back to me. It was a case of, do you know what, James? If, if you continuously check in with the people, if you continually ask them if they're okay and if you continually support them, then the rest will look after itself. Um, and that's very much what, what I found over the course of the last 14 weeks. Um, that goes to the guys working, of course. You know, we're, we're still keeping up. We're having three team meetings a week on a Monday, Wednesday, and a Friday morning. Um, you know, I'm always accessible. I'm, I'm doing a WhatsApp video every morning to all the guys just to say hi and, you know, how I'm feeling. And I think that's the other thing is, it comes back to another thing that I've always tried to be as a leader is, is very honest about how I'm feeling and how I'm doing. And, you know, one of the first things in lockdown that resonated with me was I've just got to make sure I keep doing that. Um, and, you know, I've had good days and I've had bad days. Uh, I read a quote the other day from a lady who's sorry, name escapes me now, but she said you have to have a breakdown to have a breakthrough. And that's, that's, that's very much stuck with me that, you know, in the early days of lockdown, I probably had a few little mini breakdowns. I was like, I, I don't really like this. But mm -hmm. once you embrace that um, and you see how you can grow on that and you see how you can keep your team engaged uh, and continuously work with your clients in this remote working space then, then then things continue to get better so yeah for me it was all about just really reinforcing that connections relationships with the team with the swans uh yeah. making yeah. sure they were okay and looked after and in turn we knew that our our clients etc would be looked after as well great thank you very much that's a very interesting insight there rachel how does that chime with your experience uh, you've got quite a um a wide organization, different responsibilities, both with your shops and your young people and homes. And so how does that um, feel for you? Some of, some of what James talks about is very familiar, you know, kind of going from all pretty much being office based and once in a blue moon working from home to everybody working from home and getting used to this uh, way of working. Uh, I, at the start of COVID, was five months into my CEO ship at break. So uh, it's felt a little like a very steep learning curve, which it always was going to be. I think the the plus to me is I have done many of the roles within break. So I've um, overseen or been active in, in all of the areas that we do. So I've overseen retail and done HR and organisational development and workforce development and have a big history as a qualified social worker in, in working within the, the care division. So you know, when I ring someone up or I do a Teams call or a Zoom call, then um, I come from a position of a certain amount of knowledge. So, and I do understand the hard work that people continue to work, uh, have had, you know, when you're looking after four teenagers who uh, have their own trauma and their own distress to deal with, and you can't go out to break up the group a bit to try and dissipate some of the tension. That's a real tough task. And to do that over a 12 week period, I take my hat off every day. 
So in terms of how it has changed me as a CEO, um, it's defined the kind of CEO I want to be, I think, and that's about communication and over communication. So a bit like James, I'm making sure that, you know, there's, there's a message that goes out to the 500 strong workforce every Friday in the kind of start of this, it was every day making sure that we were responding before or just after any any government updates so that they knew where we were as a charity and some of the trickiness with that is getting the balance between really being honest this is how big our kind of commercial enterprise hole is uh, without actually creating some sense of uh, stress and distress in people wondering whether or not break will get through this we will, by the way, very, very strongly. Um, but uh, yeah, we do go through this year with a loss. Uh, and, um, you know, it's trying to balance that out. I think there has been a real tension for us in terms of those who have been furloughed and can't work and those who have been on the front line and can't not work um, and have perhaps had to and have had to work harder during this period of time. But I've worked really hard to be very clear that in every way, whether you're at home supporting break because you can't do your job or whether you're in work supporting break, it's all part of the break family and we all need to work together to recover. So, uh, yeah, it's um, I think the other thing that I was thinking about when you were asking the question, Hugh, was, you know, people say that being a CEO is a really lonely place to be. I think it's even more lonely if you don't have the right team around you and the right support network when you're working from home in this level of isolation in lockdown. And I think that's something that um, has really chimed with me over the last sort of 14 weeks, however many it is. It feels like five years. <laughs> Thank you. That's, yeah, that, uh, I think that, uh, again, you come back to that tension between those who have been furloughed, those who haven't, and how does it make both sides feel? Um, and I think, I think particularly with you when you're dealing with vulnerable youngsters as well, and how you manage that. I don't, goodness knows how your carers have coped when they're not allowed out or they can't socialise with their friends. That must have been very hard, I imagine. Oh, it has, but we've got a little central uh, group of kind of a particip lead, uh, participation lead and a co-production lead who have been every day sending out, here's some, you know, we had, what do we have? Motivational Mondays, Time Out Tuesdays, Workout Wednesdays, Lord only knows what Thursdays were. And <laughs> uh, so they had little activities and everything and videos and sharing things every day alongside for our young people who are leaving care. We were delivering... Uh, food parcels all the young people who wanted to take place had uh, food parcels on the same Friday and they had kind of a cook-a-thon together so over zoom everyone was cooking the same meal with the same instructions I don't think there was a test to make sure they all looked the same or tasted the same but I think people really felt connected as as a community in that way that sounds fun that's good John, can we go to you and uh, find out sort of um, a bit more yeah, about those opportunities and challenges you face and, and how you have dealt with them and how your team's dealt with them? Um, yeah, where to start, really? Uh, it's obviously been a challenge, uh, as for everyone, um, probably one of the biggest challenges I, I think I've faced yet, um, being a leader. Um, I've had to question myself um, about, am I doing the right thing? Constantly asking myself, am I doing the right thing? Um, and asking my team around me, but also for like a confirmation that we are doing the right thing as well. Um, I'm really lucky. I've got a really good team around me as well that have, we supported each other. Um, I've had to learn about not learning to care for people, but learning about how to care for people when you can't really see them or talk to them other than through a camera or a, a telephone and to, you know, asking someone, are you okay? Most of the time, the right response of, are you okay? So it's trying to work out who's really okay and who's not really okay. And can we help people at home? Even if it's just something like a simple desk setup or are they working too much? Or, you know, are they, how are they, um, you know, balancing their work life, yeah, the, everything together to, to make it, to make it work for them. So, um, yeah, that, that's been quite a challenge. And, uh, you know, we've, I've had to, I've sat there quite a lot just double checking and questioning myself are we doing the right thing um in terms of I've, i think I've, personally i felt a bit of guilt over the furlough mm -hmm. um about how people are you know that it must be very difficult for them um and i, and I think we you know we've had to try and keep in contact and I, I think that's something that personally i could have been, i could improve on um so I've, I've learned from that keeping in contact with those you've had to furlough yes so they exactly. don't, yeah 
which is more of a challenge. Initially, there was more of an engagement, and I think some people that are still on furlough are now slightly disengaged a little bit. So we're going to have to trying to keep that going. I found I found quite a challenge personally. Um, I relied on my team for a lot of that. Um, you know, uh, my directors uh, and Jordan. They've been they've been great at keeping that communication going as well. So it's, I've not just done it myself. I've I've, I've relied and had uh, and had a good team to to help us do it really. Right. It's, it's interesting, again, the, the communication point coming up, I, I got a little snippet from a quote um, by Andy Wood, CEO of Adnum. So it was a very good article he did uh, for the CBI. And the thing that stood out for me was he said that communication had been their watchword. Um, that, that that was the, the absolutely essential to keeping their the, the Adnum's family of 500 employees together throughout this and that, that was only was quite a recent article so that, that and it's well worth reading because again he is quite uh, honest about where things have uh, not necessarily gone smoothly um, where they've learned um, and how in some ways they've learned far more about some of the members of their team than they had known beforehand I think he, in one part he says that, that they they found out that one of their team members had two autistic sons which they hadn't appreciated until they were trying to juggle this sort of working from home and uh, and um, and family life mm. um, Lisa can I just come to you now and just sort of find out how you uh, feel that this has affected your team and um, you know whether there's anything that's really stood out for you in how that process of managing this change has gone and some of what I'm going to share is is kind of what we got wrong as well so I was I'm, I, I'm an HR specialist uh, first and foremost I'd just come back from uh, being seconded to being the managing director of one of the smaller housing associations which we merged with and so I thought the next few months were just going to be get back, be reintroduced to my teams and, and maybe just take a little less of a, a, a leading role in business. And I kept saying, what are we doing about this? What are we doing? And the answers came back of, well, we'll go to our disaster recovery plan. OK, where's our disaster recovery plan? What does it say in our disaster recovery plan? Because this is unprecedented. And suddenly everyone was going, oh, yeah. It's not going to work. We need to do something different. And so we set up a flagship Cobra, which would meet every day. So it was the senior leadership team. We kept it to five people. It's a much wider team than that of senior leaders. And we said we need a priority. What's our focus going to be? And we decided on, on one simple thing, which affects three different parts of our business. And it was to keep our customers, our staff and our business safe. And that, that very simple approach um, has also led to us now having a disaster recovery plan, which is much more being able to respond to these types of situations. But it really kept us focused on the decisions we had to make. And the feedback has come back from our staff of basically, even when they didn't necessarily like the message they were getting, we were consistent with our message. And if you think about times of change, and how unsettling it is. Normally there's someone in a business somewhere who goes, yep, been there before, got, got a manual on what we can do. With this situation, we hadn't. There was no book, there was no rule book that we could find in the bottom of the drawer to help us navigate through this time. So we kept very clear on our principles. Um, we've always mostly trusted our people to do the right things we have a group of staff who just go and decide what's the right thing to do on a day-to-day -day basis whether that be our trade folk who are in a customer home deciding on what's the right repair whether it's our housing teams who are dealing with some very challenging situations that people find themselves whether it's the, how they can pay their rent or feed their children and so we've we've had that reliance on our people making the right decision and we had to as a senior team be really clear on what we were going to do and how we were going to do it it wasn't just the practical stuff of everybody take your laptops under your arms go home log in and work from there yeah, someone's already posted a comment that actually that agile working is not just about technology it's about hearts and minds and they're absolutely spot on so we said 
here's the practical stuff here's the tangible things that you need to be able to do your job and the the safe arrangements the safe systems of working here's the health and safety risk assessments and all of that stuff but actually it was about connecting with the people and my role as director of people and workplaces kind of came to the fore with both of the things that we've focused on through this time which is keeping our business safe keeping our customers safe and keeping our staff safe and not necessarily in that order you know we we've, we've often been heard to say that if our employees are happy they're going to make our customers happy which means the business kind of takes care of itself but it was about being consistent with our messages being really clear at a time of huge uncertainty but ultimately keeping our people our customers and our business safe so as leaders we've continued to hold firm to the principles that we take which is leadership is the single most important thing we do and we have continued to keep our people engaged on both an emotional and a physical level and also making sure that we've been able to tailor individual experiences to what's right for that individual when you've got 1200 staff that's kind of a challenge because you can have 1200 different ways of doing something but we've had to work really hard with our, our managers to develop their skills to be able to not just apply a rule or apply a decision that's been made at the senior level but actually to adapt it and give a level of consistency at a time of uncertainty so there's been huge investment in our people for all the right reasons and i think that's then borne out in our productivity hasn't necessarily been negatively affected um, the demands on our business have slightly changed but what we've been able to do is react and respond whilst being consistent at that very uncertain period of time and we've not lost anyone we've had james was saying you know he's not been afraid to say i'm having a bad day and that's been really powerful i just i sent out a blog to my team at one point saying just sharing with you i'm having a really bad one um i'm an extrovert i get energized and fueled by working with people reading them and and reacting to them and listening to the the noise of other people and suddenly i found myself working from home every single day with a husband that was shielding so i didn't have any downtime with him being at work and i had both my son and my daughter move back home and suddenly there's four adults around me and they're not necessarily always the ones that energize me or give me that fighting spirit but it was a, a very different environment and i was a little bit nervous about saying to my team i'm having a bad one and i'm really struggling at the moment i'm missing them i'm missing that that buzz of the office environment i'm missing the spontaneity and i'm absolutely exhausted with all what we're having to do and i was very fearful that they would lose a level of oh my gosh if lisa's lost control then and she's not having a good one <gasps> we're all doomed but the feelings that they wrote individually that they shared with each other or just to me about how they were feeling was phenomenal and humbling and made me realize that actually showing a level of vulnerability is also okay as a leader and we don't always have the answers and we don't always know what we're going to do but we are consistent and we are focused and we are true to our our core values through this time it sounds to me from all that all four of you have said that this has actually been in a odd way a very strengthening experience in that it yeah. i guess if you've if you've had the instinct um to be a good leader and listen to your team and communicate well with your team to start with this has reinforced that need no end i'm sure there are probably companies out there that maybe have fallen over because of that uh, maybe what um, Professor Carrie Cooper was alluding to that the some are just technical and don't really think about the human aspect and maybe they're, they're the stories we don't hear so much of but it sounds to me as though this could well have been uh, uh, beneficial might be the wrong word in the circumstances but that, that there is some good to come out of this in terms of what we've learned about ourselves as people and what we've learned about our teams and how they relate to each other 
Is that a fair yeah. summary? But if you're a successful leader, you have to be able to adapt. Do I feel like I'm a better leader because I'm going through COVID? I'm not sure. I think I'm a leader who can respond to the environment and flex and bend and have the deeply honest conversations that Lisa was talking about in terms of, you know, when you are having a bad day or you don't actually know the answer, ensuring that actually the team around you know that because they flex and they adapt as well because that's why you're a good team. But I, I don't... I don't, I don't feel, I think it's probably sped up my embedding into the role, but I don't think it's necessarily made me a better leader. Right. John? Kind of, I think I kind of agree. It's just, a, it's just another challenge to go through. And I've been through quite a few challenges um, since being with Breakwater. It's kind of, you know, it's, um, I don't know, I don't necessarily feel that uh, I've, arrived or anything like that through through doing this um i feel when we went into this um you know our our motto was we just want to survive you know that's we've got to make sure that the business can be still be here at the end of it so that we can go back to growth which is where we were um yeah i don't think i've changed too much um but yeah i i appreciate the challenge and i'm sure i'll look back back on it fondly when when all the horrible bits have been eradicated from my mind um but yeah i think i agree with you rachel yeah we, um, we, we're busy people and we're all doing lots of different things. What really changed though through this time is we were all focused on one thing. So regardless whether you were HR, you were IT, you were finance, you were operations, you were customer facing, we all focused. We had one issue that everything we did was about what's going on right now. And that was quite phenomenal. And it just reinforced the, if you're really clear what your vision is, or you're really clear what your purpose is, and you've got everybody, whether it's five people or 5,000 people in your business, working towards the same purpose. Oh my gosh, there is that's such a phenomenal tsunami. Probably the wrong expression to use in the current <laughs> times and everything, but you know, you've everybody pulling in the same direction, which is what all the theorists say, what all the management books you can read or all the different TED talks you can listen to. It's all about being really clear what your purpose is and everybody pulling towards the same. We had one situation that we all had to deal with and we were all facing in the same direction. COVID and that's quite a phenomenal place to be as a management team. Yeah, I think it's been, I think it's been a great challenge, really. <laughs> If, 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 if I'm honest with you, I, I, I really do. And for me, like, like, like sort of John says, I don't, it hasn't changed me as a leader. I, I think it's providing me with the confidence that I can deal with a crisis because for the 10 years that we've had Indigo Swan, to be fair, for the one year I've been managing director at Indigo Swan, I didn't <laughs> think in that 12 months this would be the crisis that I was facing. But, you know, it's been, it's been, good, to, it's been good to be thrown in the deep end. But it's given it's given me the confidence that I, you know I can deal with a crisis because I would be honest we've, we've probably had a fairly smooth sailing ten years up until this point. Uh, you have your ups and your downs as any company does, but, but by no means a crisis like this. So it's given me that confidence. Um, it's allowed me to show more vulnerability, most definitely. And as Lisa was saying, that is vitally important um, to show that and and to not be afraid to say that you're having a bad day and and, and things aren't going well and. Only a few weeks ago, I took a day off because I sort of hit a bit of, as I said, that breakdown to find that breakthrough that really hit me a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, I told the guys that I was struggling with that and, and, I, and I took a day off and that was very well respected and obviously received. And it's having, like somebody else said, having those people around you. You know, for me, I'm extremely fortunate to have a, have a strong management team. And uh, Amy, who looks after our account managers, said to me one day, James, you know, if you keep working from seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night, everyone else is going to think that's what's expected of them. Um, you know, you need to show yourself that, you know, you can take regular breaks throughout the day. You know, you're not logged on till late at night. You're not logging on first thing in the morning because otherwise that's the example that everybody's going to follow. And, you know, as leaders, we also need to have those people around us who sort of check us as well uh, and make sure that we don't fall into those traps that a lot of people will do when there is a crisis on. It's absolutely days where that has to happen and it needs to be all hands to the pump. But it's very quick to fall into those habits of working all day, you know, very long hours and, you know, the yeah. rest of your team seeing that. So 
having having a strong team around you as well uh, is vitally important to just make sure they they, they take you also. It seems to, yeah, it seems to have brought into sort of sharp relief the sort of um, distinction between good and 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 bad leadership. I just sort of I, when asked to do this, I was reading around the topic and seeing what was being said, um, and uh, there, there was a report on on the difference in working remotely in the Netherlands to the UK, uh, where in the in the Netherlands it was about fourteen percent of employees regularly worked um, remotely before this crisis, whereas in the UK it was only about 4% of employees. And they were saying it, they, it really seemed to be a matter of trust and um, culture. Uh, and quite a lot of UK workers sort of complain about working in cultures of presenteeism. And I think that from what you're saying, it, that ability to judge people on what they do rather than how long they spend doing it is a, is a critical part of being a good leader and actually just you know, trusting people to do the job they're required to do when it needs to be done, rather than peering over their shoulder. Um, in a similar vein, uh, there was a Wharton School article that said um, that too few companies invest, invest in building trust, and too many managers try to deal with remote work by controlling and monitoring employees. Uh, but that, that building trust, which is a pretty much a full-time leadership role, uh, is the way to improve improvement. And a lot of it comes down to that showing a vulnerability that I think all four of you to, to varying degrees have, have mentioned that willingness to share with your team when things are going bad for you personally and that they know that you're as much a human as they are seems to be a, a key element of that rapport that you need in your team. Yeah, I think so. And uh, we need to appreciate this is not normal. You know, yes. and I think that the, the, the sooner we were all able to appreciate that, and I said this yesterday, I said, this is this is now normal. We, we throw around the new normal or things like that, whereas this is now just normal and it's likely to be normal for, for a long time with a yeah. few little tweaks along the way. Um, but I think the appreciation and, and trying to have that appreciation as a whole team certainly helps uh, you all be there to support each other uh, and get each other through, whatever your individual challenges are. Uh, you know, just touching on the furlough point very quickly again, it's, you know, like John said, there was an element of guilt by, by having to make those guys furloughed. But very quickly in those days, you knew that their challenges were going to be very different to the guys that you had working every day. Um, and, and as a leader, that was very much my responsibility to make sure that I communicated with the guys that were furloughed just as much really in the early days as, as the guys that, that were working, just so I could really understand what their challenges were going to be. And I could really, you know, tailor my leadership to that particular individual. You know, we've got people that right. doing something like this is, is just not for them. They might want to text message, for example. That that might be the way they want to communicate. You know, and it's it's finding out from them how do they feel comfortable, what do they need, and yeah, like I say, really tweaking that approach to the individual and uh, yeah. having a understanding as a as a collective, definitely. Rachel, you had something you mentioned yesterday about this about your your approach to this idea of it being not an the not being a new normal in that it's got yeah, ongoing no, I, think I, I nicked it slightly from sandra porter not sandra porter's what's her name mary porter um in terms of this being the next normal uh because i think the new normal indicates there's a, there's an element of stability to this and we've got this now uh, and i don't think we have i think this is just another phase that we will go through uh, as um you know people are recognizing really uh, and we will move into another phase probably come the winter where there's the risk again uh, of some significant peaks and probably we will go back into uh, working from home if we can at all relax that over the next few weeks and couple of months. But I think um, there's all sorts of different challenges that um, are, are worth thinking about within this. I think, you know, I um, I lead from Norwich, head office is just around by the airport, but actually we've got people as far afield as, as Yeovil running one of our fantastic charity shops where good bargains are available every day. <laughs> and um, so the kind of the leading remotely is part of our work. That's our everyday work. I think the critical bit is leading remotely in a crisis when there is no rule book, as Lisa and James and John have, you know, we've all recognised. Unfortunately, there is no rule book. Uh, we none of us have been through it before. People look to leaders for certainty and for the answers in these times. And I think, again, as Lisa says, we can't necessarily give the certainty, but we can give the clarity. And I think if we're working within our principles, the priorities we set early on, and our value base, then people respect that. 
um, but communication, the rallying cry, the one cause, the we will thrive, we will survive and then thrive again through this are the really critical elements. It's almost just sound bites, but um, that's what helps people all work together as one. Yeah, I think that communicate, communicate, communicate bit comes through. Uh, so many different articles I've uh, read recently from um, well, managers, leaders, saying that the communication is important and it's got to be two way. It can't simply be telling people, it's got to be listening and opening up and saying, what do you need? What's missing? You know, and noticing when people aren't contributing and seeing that as possibly a, a flag that someone is actually disengaged or you know, um, feeling completely isolated and unable to communicate. And how do you get back in touch with them? Um, I think that's a great point here and I think there's, there's 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 little things that people can do to test that because how do you test somebody still engaged whilst we're working in this type of environment and something very simple I did, did the other day was as I said earlier I do my morning videos to everybody so at the end of the video I just I just hid a secret message and I said if you listen to the end of this video can you text me and send me a text that just says swan um, and yeah 95% of the team sent me that text message that said swan and, that, and, you know, that's 14 weeks in, but it was a great way for me to sense check, are people still engaged with what I'm doing? Are they still engaged with the theme? Are they still taking the time to watch that video every morning and understand what's going on? Um, the other 5%, to be fair, there was no major issues within that. But for me, it's just a great way of sort of sense checking the engagement of the team whilst we are, you know, not all together and working in a remote setting. Um, I realise we're on, uh, coming up to 10 to 3, and we've got probably another 10 minutes or so. And then I think we've run, we technically we could run until half past, but we probably don't want to keep everyone that long. Um, although I see we've still got 32 attendees, which is good. So no one's dropped out yet. Uh, I just, I'd like to just bring everyone's attention to the, the, the um, chat because there's quite a lot of conversation going on there and a lot of good ideas coming through. And um, so much so that I, I wouldn't be able to sort of pull them all up and turn them into questions. Um, but the various comments from uh, I Caroline Rust and um, uh, Chris Cliff uh, d d are recommending books and um, recommended uh, recommending te TED talks um, and uh, various other ideas. We've also got four questions that have popped up, and thank you to everyone who's put questions in there. I, I want to actually first of all come to a couple of questions that, that David. Powell's put, which sort of ties in really with where we've been. Um, and it might be that you just want to say nothing more to add to what you've got, but I just wanted to put these out there. Um, uh, it was around how do you keep people motivated when working remotely and how do you keep them on message and on top of strategy and how do you build and maintain trust remotely? Um, and whether any of you think this redefines leadership more generally um, and as as part of that same question uh, it's what is that what does this sort of remote working ha effect have on team morale on team bonding and that the way whether people is it possible to still build a culture remotely if you had to do this long term that that sense of bonding and feeling part of a team and how do you then have them still maintain the, the care in the end product or service they're providing so could i maybe come to lisa on that because i know you've got you've got this you know thirty-five thousand homes and lots of different needs within that how does your team across the region how, how do you build that team trust and that team spirit and i thank you here and thank you for the question it's Trust is, is such a fundamental part. If I was to have one golden nugget which made a difference in the culture of our business and the way we operate and how we perform and the leadership, trust is that golden nugget. And it, it was really interesting when I first joined the Housing Association, I'd never worked for housing before. I'd come from media, I'd come from commercial businesses. I'd looked after international teams where the cultures are so vastly different. And, and it, was, it was really surprising that it was the, the care, the parental care that was present from the leadership down. And what that did is it meant that people felt safe and secure because they had that parental leadership of 
that didn't work very well but just don't do it again and then there was the um the the kind I'm, I'm talking generally but there was the well no that didn't work very well so anyway i'll just go do it again so there was no accountability and there was a lack of direction and and it was just really surprising having come from almost an adult to adult environment in my last job where you are accountable for every single thing you do and you are also you are also responsible for making things better and improving so we made that shift from that sort of parental culture to a more adult to adult relationship and that's where the trust started because when i challenged the leadership team of and do you truly trust your people oh yeah i trust my team there's that team over there i'm not so certain about so agile working well yeah my team will be fine because i know they'll work from home but it's their team over there i'm not so sure it's that working from home statement and it was a really challenging time to get people to develop that trust and when they didn't trust their people or they didn't trust somebody else's team it was spending a disproportionate amount of time which paid dividends in truly understanding what was it about that particular leader that meant they were struggling to trust and that we lost some people on that journey and we gained some people on that journey but we took the decision as the senior team that trust was going to be at the heart of what we did and that was revolutionary for us but i also recognize there are other businesses out there who haven't yet got that from the top that they are trusted to do what's right and then that's often about the leader that's often about that sense of control that that leader needs to keep so I'm, I'm not sitting here with my rose colored spectacles on going yeah it's so easy to trust because that is probably the hardest nut to crack but my gosh when you crack it it can be amazing and so how you then develop that engagement i think was the second part of the question how you keep remote teams engaged i mean we've we've kind of zoom is has been amazing uh the teams microsoft teams has been amazing those platforms are amazing but we're getting a little bit tired of it as well aren't we and so yeah. it's about doing something different so we've put on just some practical things we put on some lunch and learn sessions so whether you're furloughed whether you're a non-exec director whether you are the chief exec or whether you are just um somebody who's out on the road and is not used to being in a group environment because they we often have lone workers out there then actually dial in and all right it's on zoom it's on teams but learn something something that's of interest to you so we're connecting people that way we've also set up well-being cafes and we were talking earlier about that feeling vulnerable and not every day is a great day and that isolation and some people live at home on their own and they know work at home on their own and you know that's a real challenge for a lot of people so we've we've set up mental health first aiders everybody has a buddy and uh, who's not necessarily in their team right. um and so it's someone they can call on if they're struggling but it's also that person's responsibility to call on their buddies to make sure and not just say how are you today because people will often go yeah i'm fine <laughs> And then you move on so it's about finding different ways different techniques we've done the well-being cafes where people can just dial in and just have a cup of coffee and talk to other people we've also had the fun events that we've tried to do and we have now started to reopen the offices um in completely covered secure situation there's probably about 25 percent capacity in the offices that we've opened and we've got we've got an app so people can book a desk and and we've got all the controls that we need to and some of the feedback was quite interesting staff love the fact that we've kept them safe but some staff were disappointed and when we picked the phone up and said you were disappointed for your experience and by coming back to the office why it's wasn't like it was before <laughs> no one else was there <laughs> uh yeah so it's it, it is it, i think the only thing to do is to go back to what does it mean for you what does it mean for you the individual who's in front of me right now what can we do for you and when you do that even with 13 1200 staff the needs are quite common you know listen to me talk to me 
ask about me. So when you're having a one-to-one, -one, don't just start with, here's my agenda, this is my productivity, this is my, these are how many hours I've worked, this is how I'm justifying that I'm still a valued employee. Or when you're furloughed, you know, don't not call those people, but ask them something about the family, ask them something about them that's personal. Treat them as an adult. Have that adult to adult relationship. And, you know, there are so many creative ways. We had pub crawls. We've had pub crawls on teams where you have a drink in one room, then you all go to a different room in your house and you have a drink. We've had quizzes. I mean, oh my gosh, no more quizzes. Um, but we've, we've done treasure hunts. We, it's just about being creative, but we've not made it compulsory. We've said, if you want to dial in, dial in, but then we're listening and looking for those that aren't. And then it's just maybe they want just a call or just a message. Mm -hmm. But it's about what's it about them, not what about the business. What's it about them? Make them individual, personalize it. Yeah. John, do you, do you have a view on this to, to throw in? Because I realize we haven't heard from you for a little bit. So. It's been quiet. Um, the trust thing, I think, is, is really important. Um, I think we'd often pondered about uh, trusting people to work from home, especially having a desk environment, which is a, a massive part of our business. And um, we have to cover cer certain hours. Um, I think it was interesting that we were forced into trusting people to work from home. We weren't given a choice, but actually now we do trust people to work from home. And the result of that is that, um, well, how to measure that is that we know the work's getting done. I know people are, are being looked after. We've had so many nice comments from our clients, thank you, James, about you know how the, the team have been getting them going and, and helping them through and answering 500 phone calls a day and, and all of that stuff, um, which does bring about its own stress for them. But I think that trust thing, um, yeah, we've been forced into that, but actually I didn't need to worry about it in the first place. Uh, and I think going forward there, rather than having a, we're all going to work from home, we're all going to work in the office, we're going to... Uh, we're looking at having some kind of flexible working. So, you know, if you want to work from home that day, you can work from home that day. It doesn't matter. You've still got a desk here in the office. You've still got a place. You've still got a place to put your things. Um, but if you want to work from home a couple of days a week, then that's, that's also fine. And we're not going to set it so that everyone has to do this or everyone has to do that. If people want to work in the office five days a week, great, that's fine. If you want to work from home more, than, more often than not, then that's also fine. The result, the, as long as the end result is there, and that the work's getting done, we're getting nice feedback from our clients that people are working. That's where we've got to be, isn't it? Okay. Um, on them, yeah. to adult conversations as well, Lisa, I, I, I absolutely agree with you there. Uh, I just think that that's not necessary just for remote working. I think it should be how it is, whether you're working remotely or working in the office, so before or after this, I think it's exactly how we should be working, having an adult conversation, not starting the conversation <laughs> with oh, how many phone calls have you answered? How many tickets have you dealt with? Um, how are you? You know, asking them kind of questions of people first, you know, looking after people, asking about their families. Like, like I can't remember who said now, but I've learned loads about our, our staff over this um, last few weeks and months. Um, you know, when people came in, we, we're replacing all our desks, so I asked people to come and get their belongings, which is a little bit weird. But, you know, it was nice to see people and have an actual conversation with people uh, as well. Um, I think I sometimes it's quite amazing with how much people say with the bottom half of their body that you just don't get that non-verbal communication the you know we we carry all sorts of bits in the rest of us that happens beneath this bit um, and so the kind of how are you I'm fine is much easier if it's just the face but actually there could be all sorts of things going on you know people could sit there with a broken leg and you might never know I don't think that would be the case. I think um, one of the things that we are working on and probably will need to work on more and better is to think about how we don't work in silos. So really thinking about what we have as a break organization, what our total resources, so how each little each part of the organization can help other parts of the organization in the recovery. We started that journey probably a couple of years ago where uh, within our care services, we wanted people to look up out of their, their setting and actually look to support other, other services if they were going through crises. And now we've got, I don't know, fundraising, comms, marketing, retail, and our care service is working much more collegiately together about what's the message you need us to get out how do we get that out quickly 
how can we help in that area what funding can we apply for to support that bit so it's really um, bringing the organization together as one which is something that we will fight to hold on to as we move into the next normal I think that's the thing this is an ongoing process isn't it um, we, the, I, the idea of returning to any normality or going into normality seems I th uh, yeah I, I don't see that happening as such I think it's just going to be an ongoing process of change somewhat accelerated on the past um, I'm very conscious of time but I'm also conscious that <clears throat> we've had a lot of interesting comments in the chat and we've got a number of questions that have popped up um, in the questions answered um, uh, I know that uh, the uh, one is answered which is actually from David Powers which is about keeping in touch with people um, although there was a final one about new starters and I actually wanted to come to that but there, there are a couple of others in there which we'll try and get to if we've got time around uh, working with people colleagues who have been homeschooling a lot and how they balance that time um, there's one which actually chimes this again from uh, uh, Chris Cliff which chimes with one that I've got for the end which is how have you actually been looking after yourself? How uh, being a leader can be the loneliest job. Actually, Chris, you've echoed exactly my words here. Being a leader can be the loneliest job. Um, but um, you know, even as a leader, your, your mental health matters. And how do you, you keep yourself healthy and lead by example? Um, is another one in there. Uh, Gavin Page from HSBC is asking about the struggle with um, Zoom fatigue and technology fatigue and missing out on the more subtle uh, um, body language communications. He said, finding it hard to read facial cues. I think exactly what you have just said, Rachel. Um, so I feel we might have just covered that. Um, and about uh, one from Alton Nuttall about trust when a business is in survival mode. So I'm going to try and come to those. I, I just wanted, though, to um, just think about if, if this is not. If we're, if we're not returning to an old normal and this is not really the new normal as settled, things are going to carry on changing. Uh, at some point, hopefully businesses will continue to grow and that means they'll recruit and they'll have to onboard people. Um, and I'm wondering if you're thinking ahead on this. So, I mean, looking at what I think is called Generation Z, which is my daughter's age, you know, she's been doing webinars it's, uh, over the last few months and uh, a three-week hackathon and um, virtual internships and I know that there are thousands of sort of 18 year olds doing this. Um, do you think uh, that for want of a better word you know, we used to talk about millennials as being digital natives you might want to call these the remote working natives um, in that this is you know how or certainly if they're still at school this is how they're going to be working possibly for the next year off and on both in school and remotely so when you come to doing recruitment do you think it's going to be uh, easier harder to recruit young people or more experienced people so if you've got someone who's highly experienced but just not used to working with technology um, maybe maybe that's just not the sort of person you try and recruit um, but you, what are the challenges around that, how you recruit people during lockdown and bring them into a team? I mean, you're currently working with existing teams, so there's already some element of being part of something. What, what's the future hold in terms of that, bringing people on board? I, I'm quite happy to go first, if that's all right. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, um, we brought in a new head of finance on the uh, 29th of March. Uh, he's apart from in an interview, he's only seen this part of me um, and that part of uh, the rest of the executive team. So um, I think we're already doing that. And I think this situation, we're roughly 85% uh, still in the workplace. So we're in our shops, in our care services, people aren't working remotely. They have to be where the work is. Um, so we're still looking for the same skill set, the same experience, the same knowledge base, the same flexibility and drive and passion that we always were. And I think in terms of kind of our more head office functions that are working now more remotely, our challenge isn't that finding the right skill set or the right knowledge base or the right value base. It's um, 
it's the induction period so it's not so much the recruitment but the how do you then help them get embedded into a culture when actually their culture is their four walls probably at home for most of their induction um so that has created a bit of a challenge for us and we are working very hard on how to develop that as we move forward um but i think recruitment by zooms you lose on some of the um non-verbal communication but uh, the process doesn't change but there is that thing about the, the, the saying that you when you rent an office you get culture for free as such you know, you, you, you know when you have an office because you just by dint of the fact you've got people working together face to face physically yeah. yeah that creates a certain atmosphere and as you say if it's, if your experience of office life is the four walls of your own sitting room or wherever it might be yeah. that's a different cultural experience um, I, think, I, I, I agree with you, but I suppose in a moment in time, and one of the things I was going to say on the on the last question was ultimately, it's as a as a, as a company and as a team, it's embracing this, isn't it? It's embracing what this is. Let's, let's stop worrying about it. Let's stop thinking about it. Let's just embrace what this is. And this this is this is our new culture. Until somebody tells me otherwise, this is our new culture. This is the way that a business will now work. This is the way that I would go out go out and recruit people. This is the way that I would induct people. This is the way that I would do people's appraisal. So a big part of it for me and a big part of it for the team is now embracing this and having fun with it. You know, we, we've done 14 weeks now. We've, we've got over that initial period of mourning of not being in the office. You know, we're now at a new awakening, so to speak, of, you know, this, this, is, this is our culture. We will return to the office in some capacity in the future, most definitely. But for now, let, let's embrace this. This, this. this is the culture of Indigo Swan now. And what does the culture of Indigo Swan look like with Microsoft Teams? with Zoom, how do we have fun with that? How do we engage our teams with that? You know, how would I look to recruit with that? I mean, from a recruitment point of view, we always want to try and employ local talent. But looking beyond that, there's a geographical benefit potentially where we can source and maybe attract talent from further afield. You know, we you know, we might there's been people that's approached me over the years of saying, oh, I'd love to come work for Indigo Swan. I go, well that's great, but you know, sadly the way that we do things is you need to be in Norfolk and in the office. And you know, that's been that's been a shame. Whereas now that opens up that you know, opens up the whole world to, to opportunity and to talent, uh, which obviously you'd like to find on your doorstep. I'm not saying, you know, stop people getting jobs in North, that's not what I'm saying. But it does, it does very much open up a talent pool and an opportunity moving forward. And that's a big yeah. part of embracing, you know, a new culture uh, in a remote work setting. Lisa, John, do you sort of chime with that? Is that your feel? Kind of. Uh, we've recorded someone over the last couple of months. Um, the first couple of months was a lot of Zoom, there were a lot of Teams meetings, running through processes, uh, setting up time with other people to learn about that side of the business. So that, that did work really well. Um, so that when he came into the office a couple of weeks ago to help with a bit of the refurb, he, he was much more relaxed actually when we met him, because um, I think he'd have been through that and um, because we'd put that time in. But I think the onboarding process, doing it remotely, we spent a lot more time doing it than we might have done had they been sitting on a desk in the office with us so you can pick up on stuff let them get on with a job kind of come back whereas um how we were doing it you spend an hour two hours on a team's call going through some processes and and how we do things you know, there's a, a lot of learning there we, we have quite a lot of processes um so yeah whether we'll hire remotely or not in future i suppose we'll We'd have to see what the pool of talent's like at the time. If there's local, great. If not, then there's potential to hire remotely. I, I personally really like um, social interaction. Like you can't see my hands when, when you're on a Zoom call. Like, is that what you said, Rachel? You can't you can't see that, and you can pick up a lot from 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 that and being in the office with someone. Um, and that's been one of my big misses of lockdown is missing picking up on things that are going up going on in the office. Miss miss overhearing. A conversation that might be going on and think yeah that's that or someone else picking up on that and that's something you i don't think is replicatable is that a word on on teams um if you know what i mean so yeah lots of use of technology but i think you still can't personally i still don't think you can beat human interaction face to face yeah lisa is that uh, we We've onboarded. Um, we've been doing an element of onboarding remotely before all this happened, uh, just because people are in different geographical locations. So we were running some some teams uh, for some of the compliance stuff, um, rather than doing the compliance at each location, we were getting people to dial in. Um, but we've just kind of 
done what we've always done, but we've done it a little bit differently. And we have lost some things. And I think John is, is absolutely right. The big thing we've lost is that impromptu, just overheard, just picked up. Uh, we don't, you don't get that. And when you've got lots of people on the call, you can't all talk at the same time. And so we have lost some things, but I think through this time, we've probably gained more than we've lost and we've just made it, this is what we do and this is how we do it. And I don't think, I, I, I try not to put people in a box of your Generation X. I mean, my mum is one of the biggest user in her 80 year old plus, and, and she's on WhatsApp keeping up with her grandchildren. And I do have to keep reminding my children, be careful your grandma can see this. <laughs> but it's, you know, there are people who are at different stages and you've got young people who aren't into technology, less so. But we were, we were getting to a place where we were, we were having people apply for jobs through their Xbox. You know, let's make it really simple for people yeah. to find us and to apply for a job. And let's hire them for their attitude and we can train them for their skills. But let's, let's absolutely keep doing what we've been doing, even if we've got some bits wrong and we've got yep. a lot right. We're people, we've got a business to run. We want the best people in our business delivering the best services to our customers and therefore the business is in a very healthy, safe place. And that principle doesn't change whether you're John's business, Rachel's business, James's business, my business, or any of your businesses out there we all want the same thing which is the best people so let's hire the best people because of their attitude and let's train them in anything else we want them to do and let's not lose sight that they are all we are all individuals and let's just adapt each situation that fits with that person to get the best out of them i think that's a really a really good point i think this the, the focus on the attitude let's you know, worry about the skills afterwards it almost it's it, it's that is it's key because if the attitude's right you're going to go a long way with them um i think uh, i'm looking at our time here we're just uh, we're a quarter of an hour into the extra time um a couple of people have had to drop out i see i've had thank yous also from david powells for the great answers in the debate um and helpful just to hear others having the same issues and how they've been overcome so clearly these are these are uh common issues that you're you're sharing um i don't know panel can you all see the q a um we've got three q a's at the bottom popping up can you all see that um save me running through them all i'm wondering if there's uh, in the few minutes remaining is there one we've sort of touched a lot on the, the mental health and supporting each other and and uh, things so i think that maybe that question's already answered so I'm looking at one around homeschooling and, and how you've adjusted your expectations of staff working. But also there's a final one about um, this, whether if a business goes into survival mode, does, does the leadership style have to change to something more authoritarian? Uh, no, I mean, right here, I? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I somehow thought that would be be, be the response. I, I assume um, Rachel and John and uh, and Lisa are sort of a similar view. That you, yeah, that that would be yeah. probably you'd see as retrograde. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I used to used to be a social worker, and and my mantra was always: the second I decide what's going on in a family or a business or a situation, people stop helping me understand because I've taken an expert position. So if we do that as leaders, then we will not be creative, we will not be innovative, we will not be co-producing some amazing things with our teams because we've told them what they need to do. And I don't think we survive and thrive uh, without innovation and creativity and teamwork. Okay, well, uh, let's take that one as answered and then I'll go to John and Lisa then and say, um, and thinking particularly uh, for, for Lisa, <clears throat> thinking of the range of your services you provide, this thing, the, the challenge for parents and balancing this, it, um, is there anything on that side of things, or, or John, where you think you've experienced it or you, you've seen something you think could actually work to make it easier for parents to balance the homeschooling, assuming, you know, so school's meant to go back in September, but if there's another lockdown or local lockdowns, that presumably puts a lot of pressure on, on um, working parents. So is there anything around there you'd like to share? 
I don't luck well, not luckily, I suppose. I, we've not I've not really had to deal with too much of that. I think some people, a couple few of our staff have had to do a bit of homeschooling, but we've just been flexible with them. We've given them the allowances to do to work late or to start early or just have a bit of time off to do what they need to do to, you know, get the kids to school or to do the, the homeschooling. It's um you know, sometimes a kid pops up on a lap or in the background on a on a Teams meeting, you just kind of accept it, don't you? Um yeah, I, I can't really add more than that, I don't think. Yeah, okay, that's fair enough. That's good. Lisa, is there anything? I mean, you don't have to add anything to it beyond what's already been said, unless you've got something that springs to mind. I think I, I think I put in my pitch for this that work is what we do, not where we go. And where we can trust people, where we're managing the output and and judging people by their output rather than their input. So if if you are a parent and you've lost your network of childcare because you've not been able to be connected with grandparents and other people who help you with the childcare and the homeschooling requirements, then, then we've adapted, we've been flexible and we've managed the output, not the input. So just because you may have worked nine till five or nine till 12, then why do you need to work nine till five, nine to 12, as long as the work is done? Now, when it's interacting with customers, obviously there is a different control that you need to have in place. You need um, the right resource available for when your customers are more commonly contacting you. But where we can, we've taken, um, put people on furlough because of that. Um, that's not an indefinite situation, obviously. Uh, we've also been able to say there is flexible working, all staff get flexible working if they want it, but the agile working has set us up to enable managers to manage the output of somebody's employment and not their input. One of the, thing, one of the things we did here as well was um, moved some different tasks around. So where we had the guys working, it was a case of, well, you know, if, if, if the mums or the dads or whatever were going to need to do some work as different as they may, then we'd swap maybe then to do more administration tasks. So they okay. could do administrative tasks that were able to be done at any time of the day as opposed to sort of customer facing tasks that you need someone else to do. So yep. being flexible with that and giving different people different responsibilities based on their own personal situation. Um, and, and that so far has worked quite well as well. Okay, excellent. I think we've probably covered all the questions. I think we're running out of time. So um, I'd like to first of all thank the panel for um, all of your contributions. Lisa, John, Rachel and James and for all the uh, attendees. Um, we've only lost about uh, four or so in the last uh, 10 minutes who've obviously run out of time but that's fine um, and thank you for everyone who posted questions. I think some of the things that really come through here are uh, that the need for flexibility, adaptability, trust, trust, trust all the time. You've got to treat people like adults, you've got to listen to people and that communication's got to be honest and open and two-way and um, regular, it, not constant in a deluge, but uh, c consistent in terms of people know you're always going to be in touch and they can always get in touch with you when they need it. Um, but I think that, that trust and that maturity uh, seems to come through time and time again in all the comments. Um, is there one word that stands out? Just go around all of you. Is there one word that really stands out for you? What's the what's the thing that you would say to people to take away from this? I mean, I think the, the one thing for me to take away is that your work is your family, and I think for me that's that's a strong message. You know, it's a, it's an extension of your family, really, your workplace and the people that work for you, and you know, the way that we're sort of tackling our family lives during this now, if you can take a lot of those things and bring them to your business and that covers off your trust, your engagement, the responsibilities, open and honest communication as you would have with your family, hopefully in most cases. Um, for me, that, that, that's, that's served us well. And it's, and it's just remembering that really, it's just remembering that in these times of extreme challenge uh, and adversity that, you know, your, your workplace and the people that, that work with you or for you are, are, are your family and, if you can take the same approach with them as you take with the people uh, that you care for and love, then things things will be good and things yeah. will uh, you know look after themselves and they and they look after you also, which is which is just as important. So can yeah. I, can I go to Lisa and then John then Rachel to sort of give your final thoughts on the same subject? Well, I was just trying to choose my final word, um, <laughs> and I, I was tossing between 
authentic and personalization. So I'm going to stick with an authentic personalization. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, I think James said every other word that I wanted to say there, really. But um, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. you're not alone. Right? No, you're not alone. There's, you know, we're all leaders and we're all here to, to help each other and, and, and your colleagues are there to help you as well. I think um, going into a hole would be the worst thing you can do. That's not one word, is it? Sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel. Oh, there you go. I think um, managing all of that in one word was quite some ask. Uh, I think uh, everything that everyone has already said, but also uh, that uh, leading isn't about one person. It's about the rallying cry. It's about the whole organisation. It's about working as a team or a family, if you want to put it that way. Um, but being clear about what you're trying to achieve. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. That's been a fascinating uh, conversation. Thank you all for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all of your insights. Good luck in the coming uh, weeks, months, years. <laughs> um, uh, let's maybe try and do this again and catch up and find out uh, how people are coping. Um, obviously, if anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to drop them through to the chamber. We can always, I guess, uh, Kayleen, we could gather those. Um, if you want to email um questions or comments then we're very happy to hear those um i'll um, send out a survey to everyone just gathering feedback um oh, obviously brilliant. this is our first online panel discussion so we really do appreciate feedback so then we can make sure that we can develop our online offering um and deliver what our people not our people but members and non-members want from the brilliant. webinars um, and online offering we're doing Cool. That's oh, superb. That's well, I'll just say to the 25 um, attendees, when you get that survey, if you've got any questions you'd like to ping back to uh, any of the panel or, or myself for that matter, um, please use the survey. Hopefully there'll be a sort of free text bit where you could do that. I'm sorry if we haven't necessarily picked up on every comment in the chat. There are lots of very good ones. Uh, are you saving that chat comment? Um, have you saved that down, Kayleen, just to sort of see if there's anything worth, we, maybe we can pull that out at some point maybe one of the team can put it into a report um you, you can yes ask one last thing. can i plug um an event or a virtual event we have on thursday absolutely yes go uh, we're having a virtual cyber security conference on thursday morning at 10 o'clock it's free um we've uh, got one of our suppliers talking from mimecast um but we've also hired uh, an ethical hacker called um fc so All right. and, and he's going to talk about lots of things he possibly shouldn't talk about um, but it should be really fascinating about um, the cyber world. And we're trying to tailor it towards people working from home as well. Um, you know, different threats and how different kind of scams and things are working and what to look out for. So um, breakwaterit.co.uk forward slash events, I think. Go and have a look. Well, I did see it on Twitter earlier and retweeted it. Um, so I think if, also if it's on LinkedIn, I'll look, see it there. Um, we'll put it in the survey email as well. Thank you. That's really good. Could we also put in the link to Rachel's fundraising? That's on my to-do list. That's on your to-do list. Lisa, James, is there any link or future event that's coming up in the next week or so you want to plug? No, I'm going to go and create one now and send you the link. Okay. <laughs> Lisa, for you? No, it's all Sorry. good. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Brilliant. Well, look, I'll let you all go. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure to chat to you all. Thank you very much for your time. And, and Kayleen, thank you for organising. And um, I'm so glad this didn't crash. It was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> having done so in rehearsal. Um, thank you very much. I wish you all well. And please do keep in touch. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.